Welcome, welcome everybody to the third seminar um, of Global Sociology Live. Um, last week, you remember, we talked with David Harvey about neoliberalism, um, the new forms of global capitalism that we face today in so many parts of the world, um, but especially the importance of finance capital and its consequences for different parts of the world. Indeed, David Harvey emphasized how important uh, it is to look at the different consequences in different parts of the world. Well, today and in subsequent weeks, we're going to be looking more um, intensively at how this new form of capitalism, neoliberalism, how it affects different places in the world, looking at the sort of detailed um, day-to-day -day life, social movements, social organizations on the ground, giving those effects, in a sense, a sociological vision. And so next, next week, Ananya Roy uh, will be coming here to talk about um, microfinance and her recent book called, she calls it, Poverty Capital. And she will be talking about microfinance in uh, the Middle East of all places, so that should be very interesting to hear her talk next Wednesday. Um, today we are very honored indeed to have with us my friend, colleague, uh, Michael Watts, who uh, has taught for many years in the geography department here, professor here. He is the author of uh, uh, many books, uh, including uh, Silent Violence, and this was about famine, food, and peasants in northern Nigeria. He's put, written a book called Liberation Ecologies. Um, and he also wrote, was a particularly relevant perhaps to this seminar, a book called Reworking Modernity, which is really about the way global processes take on and are reworked uh, take on specific characteristics at the local level and are reworked at the local level. Indeed, that is the hallmark of his, all his work, is to see how global processes take on very different forms in different places in the world. Um, more recently, he produced a book, a fascinating book, um, of, uh, that documented the history, 50 years history, of the oil industry in the Niger Delta, a book that he produced with... Uh, Ed Cashy, and um, it's a collection of photographs edited by, uh, by Michael. And so that, in a sense, is, is, is where we will, in a sense, begin today. Um, he's going to talk to us about precisely um, his understanding analysis of what happens in the oil Niger, the Niger Delta. And the title of um, the talk today is Dispossession. No, it's not. It's oil <laughs> dispossession and violence. So let's all welcome Michael Watts. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, you all know that Michael only said those nice things to try to soften me up. And you should know that that's because Michael, uh, he's a wonderful guy, but has an atrocious taste in soccer teams. <laughs> and supports Manchester United. And in my view, supporting Manchester, this is a class about capitalism, <laughs> supporting Manchester United would rather be like supporting ExxonMobil or Microsoft. <laughs> now, where people like me uh, support teams that admittedly don't win, they may be atrocious, but at least we're not following the money. <laughs> anyway, thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, here's what I'd like to do today. Since you read and talked to uh, Harvey recently, I'd like to frame my remarks in relationship to David's wonderful book on uh, neoliberalism. And I want to address some of these issues from the vantage point of a certain part of the world, but maybe more profoundly from the vantage point of a particular industrial sector and, a, and what we could call the political economy of resources, in this case, oil and gas. And arguably, you know, oil and gas, oil in particular, it's the basis of our hydrocarbon capitalism. It's arguably one of the most global of commodities and resources. It's arguably one of the most geostrategically important of commodities. You could argue, some have, you know, that post-1944 U.S. foreign policy is not explicable outside of the search for cheap oil. And the fact that we have now, relatively recently, something called a national energy security policy speaks very powerfully, right, to the politics of oil and gas in particular, where we get it from, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, 
So let me just start with, uh, Michael asked me to speak for 15 minutes. Let me just speak with a two-minute framing uh, around uh, Harvey. Well, Harvey's obvious point is to try to say where does neoliberalism, in a sense, come from and get its purchase. Neoliberalism understood as a set of ideas, practices, which liberate the entrepreneurial spirit through free markets, free trade, and robust property rights. In a sense, then, as I see what David is doing, he's saying sort of, to the extent that that definition is really as much about liberalism as neoliberalism, he's sort of saying, what's the neo in neoliberalism? And in a sense, as my read of it, he's saying, well, actually, there's, you've got to think neoliberalism in terms of three ways, three issues. One, there's a, it has a theory of the economy, free markets, free trade. also has a theory of the state, a minimalist, facilitary, non-regulatory state, but also one in which the power of the executive is privileged often, and often in which there's often a grave skepticism, incidentally, to popular democracy. And thirdly, he also has, neoliberalism has a, a theory of the subject, of the individual. And in a sense, I think what he's pushing toward here is maybe being better expressed by Foucault in his lecture on biopolitics, when he talks about neoliberalism having contained within it a set of processes by which we become entrepreneurs of ourselves. I thought it was a brilliant insight. It's the idea that in some sense we take risks, we invest. Our lives is an entrepreneurial life. So it seems to me Harvey's trying to work us through those things as they have purchased in contemporary neoliberalism as a globally hegemonic political economy of ideas, if you like. And then he tries to work us through a number of issues. He sort of talks a little bit about um, how it became dominant. How did these ideas become dominant? Talks a little bit about the, you know, Hayek and how Hayek rose. And frankly, I wasn't terribly convinced of that story. I think if you want to, I think the story by which, let's just take one institution, the World Bank, becomes a center of neoliberal thinking from, for example, the 1950s when it was nothing of the sort is actually a complicated process. And to invoke neoliberal think tanks on the Heritage Foundation and Hayek, etc., it seems to me mate, is part of the story, but I don't think we fully understood it. And don't forget, by the 1960s, no, 50s, <coughs> Hayek thought his project was defeated. He was depressed, in Chicago, not a happy guy, he thought all of his ideas. So, but anyway, he talks about, Harvey talks about how they become dominant. He talks a little bit, obviously, about what neoliberalism represents a restoration of class power. He talks about how, what are the processes by which it operates. And one of the distinctive ones for him is, of course, accumulation by dispossession, a type of primitive accumulation. Right? And he also talks about how neoliberalism has purchase and dominance in other parts of the world. Most provocatively, his account of China, neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics. Honestly, I wasn't convinced by that either. I'm not, China may be many things. But I don't see it as being, in any self-evident way, a neoliberal project with a communist party of its power, of its regulatory capacities, of the, recently, the growth of state-owned enterprise. It doesn't seem to me to neatly fit, but be that as it may, it's a brilliant <laughs> account of neoliberalism. Now, what I want to do is just think about some of those ideas in relationship to oil and gas in a particular part of the world, and to that extent, I'm going to address three issues. I know you've read... Uh, a couple of pieces, and I'm not going to repeat them, but maybe for our global audience, um, I'll frame it in a slightly different way. So I'm going to talk about three issues. Firstly, let me talk about the global oil and gas sector and industry. And I just want to make a couple of points here. I mean, obviously, it's huge. It's, you might say, dominated by some of the largest forms of corporate capital in the world, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, and so on. It has a vast infrastructure. We've We've dug a million oil wells in the last 50 years. 50,000 new wells are drilled every year. There's uh, something like 2 million kilometers of pipelines. It's a huge, vast infrastructure, obviously. Um, but I think there's something else going on here about this industry that sits a little uneasily with the idea of neoliberalism and the hegemony of neoliberalism. And let me just give you a sense, firstly, of what I'm talking about. Firstly, it's true, the major oil companies, the majors as they're called, are big and dominant players. I don't have to tell you that. But we've seen an extraordinary shift in the last 30 years, in which now, in terms of ownership of reserves and in terms of output, the largest and most important players are what? 
state-owned enterprises from petrostates, Saudi Aramco, PDVSA in Venezuela, the, Iran, the Iranian Petroleum Company, etc., etc. They actually, um, Rosneft, uh, Gazprom, they make BP look like, forgive me, diminutive little startup companies. They're vast and huge. One. Two, in the center of the global oil and gas industry is what? Something called OPEC. What's OPEC? OPEC, after all, is a cartel. We can argue about how successful it's been. Historically, quite successful. On other occasions, it's fallen apart. But it does account for 30% of global production. It does accounts for a huge proportion of total reserves. Well, by definition, a cartel isn't about a free market anything. No? Or it's a complicated sense of, or, of, of a market structure. Okay? And thirdly, what we know about this global oil and gas business is that it's as a market, if by that we're looking at the prices of what we pay for oil and gas, is a very curious one. It's curious because it bears absolutely no relationship to fluctuating patterns of supply and demand. It doesn't. You can't explain, in fact, that huge run-up in oil prices in 2008, 150 a barrel. The, use, the, the market analysts will tell you, well, God, the Chinese economy pumping along, the Indian economy demand. Well no, well, no, actually. It wasn't that. And how, if it was, how can we explain the catastrophic crash in prices so quickly? <coughs> the history of the oil and gas market is, in fact, about managing supply and managing surplus. The history of the oil and gas market is keeping stuff off the market through collusion back in the 1950s and 60s, through the so-called Seven Sisters, and now partly related to the cartel and OPEC, etc., etc., so what I want to leave you with, my first point then, is that this, as a dominant and a terrifically important, I mean, after all, what is energy? It's a force of production. It's, you know, there are other hydrocarbons, but oil and gas are the hydrocarbons, at least for the foreseeable future, perhaps unfortunately, uh, that are going to drive this capitalist system. Right? And what I'm saying is, if you look at it in terms of a set of presumptions about neoliberalism, this, to me, looks like a type of counterpoint to it. It looks like something that is so highly regulated, characterized by patterns of collusion and manipulation. It doesn't look like, to me, free market anything. So it's odd, okay, for something so important and so big. And let me just say, of course, I should have made this point, the oil and gas sector, don't think of it as just the oil majors and a bunch of other oil companies, state-owned or otherwise. It's the oil service companies. It's the engineering companies. It's the banks that have to fund them. Even a BP and a Shell can easily fund a deep water offshore platform. It needs finance capital. And then think of all of the military and paramilitary apparatuses that in fact support that industry. So I've called that an oil complex. And it seems to me this oil complex, these complicated sets of institutions, that are very much part and parcel of how we might think about the oil and gas industry. And what makes it, for me, both obviously capitalist at one level, huge profits can be made, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it doesn't neatly correspond and conform to a certain sense of neoliberalism. First point. Second point. Let me say a few words, then, that sort of that frame uh, the discussion of my story about one part of the world that is an oil producing state, namely Nigeria. Let me talk then about oil producing states as another phenomenon. There are a bunch of them, right? And by oil producing states, I simply refer to those states in which the production of oil and gas represents a very significant proportion of gross domestic product or foreign exchange earnings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a country like Nigeria, after all, it's close to half of GDP, it's 80%, 85% of government revenues come from oil, and 98% of foreign exchange earnings. Ditto Saudi Arabia, Russia less so, etc., etc. There are a bunch of these states then, mostly a good number of them in the Muslim world, a big bunch of them in the developing world, and a bunch of advanced capitalist states, most obviously Russia. So let me talk then a little bit about this oil state phenomena and how that does or does not relate or sit with respect to some of these neoliberal ideas that I've talked about. Now, the first thing that I want to say is that, of course, many of these states may have been subject to 
what Harvey describes. Free market, laissez-faire, neoliberal reforms. Many of the countries themselves may be party to world trade agreements, multilateral free market agreements, etc., etc. Many of them may have had structural adjustment programs, which is precisely about the process of opening up to foreign capital, etc., etc. But what is striking to me about these petrostates, again, is in fact that they fit rather oddly or awkwardly with a sense of the type of neoliberal state. In the way that I was implying, China, for me, fits oddly into a certain vision of a type of neo contemporary neoliberal state. Why is that? Well, first of all, because petrostates are characterized by large, often inefficient, often corrupt, but highly centralized bureaucracies. After all, the states depend on oil, and how do they acquire that oil? Well, they do it almost identically around the world. They establish a statutory monopoly over all mineral rights. They set up a national oil company, PDVSA in Venezuela, Sonangol in Angola, the Nigerian Petroleum Company in Nigeria. And they then operate jointly with the majors, Shell, Exxon. And they have what are called joint venture agreements, and they basically cut the value of every barrel of oil produced. And typically, about two-thirds of every barrel of oil flows directly to state coffers. Two-thirds. Depending on price, if it goes above 80, 90 a barrel, it can be 85 to 90 percent. I'm not painting here a picture of those poor, big oil companies that are getting raked over the coal. I'm not. But I'm saying, I'm trying to picture of the petro-state itself. Right? So, statutory monopolies, that process then of, it's, some, it's what are usually called rents. This is a classical rentier state, where the rents acquired from oil are a hugely disproportionate share of all economic activity and may bankroll the state, foreign exchange earnings, etc., etc. Right? And the third part of the petro state that I think uh, is important. Um, has to do with the fact that there is always a political mechanism by which those oil revenues are distributed. It looks differently in Indonesia than it does in Nigeria, than it does in Russia. But there's a political mechanism, usually called the revenue allocation process. And I tried to describe that a little bit in Nigeria, which is a federal system, 36 states, based on a US type of system. And there's a very complicated set of formula by which the state keeps a bunch of money, a bunch of the money gets distributed to the local states in the federation, and then a bunch more money gets devoted to local governments, and a little bit then gets to the area where the oil fields are. But of course, that system, that system of revenue allocation can be corrupt, it can be corrupted, lots of money doesn't get to where it's supposed to get to, but nonetheless, it seems to me then that petrostates are wrapped up with the politics of that revenue allocation process. Now, I say that because there's a huge body of academic work, and the World Bank has waded into this too, mostly by economists, Jeffrey Sachs, Joe Stieglitz, who said, ah, yeah, that's why, in fact, all of these petrostates, they suffer from the resource curse. The resource curse is if you depend heavily enough on one of these resources like oil, you actually produce an incredibly crappy, crony capitalism, inefficient, economic performance is terrible, lack of transparency, the, the system's bleeding. Okay? And it seems to me, what I wanted to make here is just not only the point then that we have a petrostate that stands awkwardly into, with respect to neoliberalism, I also want to say that I think that resource curse idea is also equally problematic because it sort of lumps all of these petrostates together, they're corrupt, inefficient, etc., etc., without realizing, in fact, that you've got to take seriously the local politics that shape and frame how these revenues are allocated. And just, just to flag in 30 seconds, right? in that sense, Venezuela and Russia and Nigeria are hugely different types of petrostates, even though they might suffer from a resource curse. Uh, incidentally, the problem with the resource curse, of course, is that it's a type of commodity determinism. It says, you know, if, you, if you've got a bunch of this stuff, it somehow determines a particular set of outcomes, which is nonsense. It's no more determinative than anything else. But my point is then, let's take Venezuela. With whatever you think of Mr. Chavez, you may love the guy. You may think he's a populist dressed up in military clothing. But the reality is what he's done is, in fact, when he came to power, Venezuela, major oil producing, he vastly changed who got that money. 
He cut out the Venezuelan middle classes. They're hugely pissed off, let me tell you, and they'll do anything to get rid of the guy. And he sunk a bunch of money, probably in an unaccountable, transparent way, into the barrios. They love him. That's a particular resolution. Russia's very different. Russia, in fact, privatized, back in the, uh, in the Yeltsin period, as Michael knows, but much better than I, privatized them in what Marshall Goldman is referred to as the largest organized economic theft in history, out of which emerged the oligarchs, or the oligarchs. Putin then, of course, realized that these buggers are actually very powerful, influential, and he's got to rein them in, and effectively he renationalized them. And he sends Mr. Khodorkovsky up to Siberia for 12 years. But what Putin brilliantly did is to use some of that oil money, hence why he's very support, popular in the provinces, for all manner of entitlements, which your average Russian got some access to. And that's very different from the Nigerian case. The Nigerian case, it seems to me, is an instance, I hope you got this from, at least from reading a little bit of what I wrote, that here is a multi-ethnic state, a federal system, in which all, a huge proportion of the oil revenues simply get squandered and corrupted and stolen. The World Bank reckons, since 1960, maybe $500 billion are just disappeared. But, an, but another big chunk of it, actually, is in the process is put to the service of what I would call the purchase of consent. In a multi-ethnic, highly contested, multi-religious society, the oil monies, the state, becomes the mechanism by which you attempt to purchase, as it were, political consent, by, by fair means or foul, by simply distributing, in an ad hoc way, oil monies. Now, the state under these circumstances doesn't look like a terribly Weberian state at all, or a neoliberal state. It's a big sump. And of course, you're going to, among other things, produce a lot of sentiment which begins to see this state as corrupt and failed. And since we've just lived through this extraordinary process in Egypt that we've just seen, what, one of the things that we've seen in Nigeria, but and also in oil-producing states, is a challenge to these failed corrupt oil states as instances of failed secular national development. And what gets put into its place? Well, one of the things, if it happens to be the Muslim diaspora, that can be put in its place is an alternative Islamist project. Not always, but it can be. There's a version of that in Nigeria, incidentally. So my point in, the, my second point then, is that this, these oil states stand awkwardly in relationship to a certain sense of neoliberalism, but we have to understand their complicated local dynamics rather than hand-waving and saying they're subject to the resource curse and they're corrupt and they're transparent. And as Paul Collier, the World Bank economist, put it, they just suffer from the survival of the fattest, as he put it. Right? Pol politicians are just raiding and pu the public purse. Thirdly, and finally, the last point is oil and conflict. And again, I'm not going to repeat a lot of what I said here, but the question that I wanted to pose is why is it? that these, let's just take oil-dependent states, are so turbulent and so volatile and tend to be associated, and there is actually, and Jeffrey Sachs, among others, and Paul Collier have shown this, there's a close association, actually, between the extent to which economies are dependent in a significant way on resources. Could be copper, could be diamonds, could be gold, but especially oil, and civil conflict, including civil war. And he, of course, is writing particularly as an expert on Africa. And you think about the history, the relatively recent history of West Africa, where a series of failed states or collapsed states have been wrapped up with a bunch of insurgencies in which the insurgencies themselves often fund themselves through control, the predation of key resources. Diamonds in Sierra Leone, I guess you've seen Brad Pitt. Is it Brad Pitt? Blood diamonds? Matt Damon? No, it's not it's Matt Damon, was it? Leo, Leo <laughs> DiCaprio, thank you. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. Uh, all right, so last point then is to say, why is it that these oil-dependent states in particular suffer from such conflict? And here I wanted to sort of in some sense say, well, A, is it as simple as Paul Collier in a very influential book called The Bottom Billion thinks, where he says, well, I'll tell you why it is. It's because these sorts of insurgencies and rebellions and civil conflicts have nothing to do with grievance. He says it's the political left that looks at these insurgencies and sees a theory of grievance. He said, no, 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 no. It's greed. They simply predate the resource. The question is, gold and oil and copper are different. The question is, how do they do it? 
And they need to predate that because he says, rightly in my view, you have to have a theory, an account of how rebellions are financed. And he says, well, it could be diamonds, Leo DiCaprio, you know, it, but it, 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 they pr predate oil. How do you predate oil? Well, you can do it through extortion. You can threaten to blow up a pipeline. And you get the oil company, the government, to pay you a million dollars. You can't actually steal oil. There is a huge global oil theft business. It's well developed in Nigeria, but it's in the Caspian, etc. Providing you know the technology is actually not difficult to actually do it. It's been estimated that 15%, incidentally, of U.S. oil imports are stolen. Or hot oil. So, all of, but the point is then, is it as simple as that? Are these insurgents and these conflicts that I described in the oil producing Niger Delta that's received all of the downside, the ecological footprint of the industry, has historically been marginalized because they are ethnic minorities from the oil revenue allocation process? Is this really just about a bunch of thugs? Collier is clear. He says, look, you've got to understand insurgencies are organized crime. <coughs> Well, I would say one person's greed is another person's grievance, right? One person's theft is another person's accumulation. And what I tried to then do is just to paint, finally, a picture of the complexity of these conflicts. All insurgents typically involve, of course, all manner of, quote, legal and illegal activities, of personal ambition, personal greed, and a political... P that shouldn't surprise us. But rather than seeing it as a polarity, we have to somehow see how these things come together. And what I tried to do in a couple of the pieces you read is give you a sense of the variety of conflicts that emerge in these oil-producing states. Right? Some are insurgencies. Some actually have to do with communities fighting among themselves over where the boundaries of their territory are, because where the boundaries fall determines whether oil is located in their territory. And by virtue of whether it is or is not, they do have some access to the oil companies who have to pay them rents. So that's another type of conflict. You have conflicts where you have, in, now I'll just make this my last point, in the, in the context of communities in the oil fields. I've tried to do some ethnographic studies that look at why some of these, vi these villages are so conflicted. They're conflicted often because the chiefs in these villages are the intermediaries with the oil companies who get the rents, in theory for community development, but pocket themselves. In, these, in this part of Africa, where you have a strongly gerontocratic, age-related societies, what you have are the emergence of what are called youth groups, who begin, in fact, to challenge the customary rule of the chiefs, and in many cases actually throw them out of office and put, substitute themselves because they now have access to the oil rents. I just, I just would say that this looks <coughs> to me quite like, or not unlike, the origins of the Mafia in 19th century Italy, right? where the Mafia emerged in the context of sharp <coughs> class polarities. We have something like that. Where, so all of which is to say, then, finally, I just wanted to flag for you the complexity of these conflicts and how this rentier system generates all manner of positioning by different types of groups, insurgents, youth groups, ethnic groups who want to claim a state for themselves so that they can get an access to the oil money, etc., etc. And the final thing I wanted to say is that this, for me as a geographer, like Harvey, concerned with space, what strikes me about this is that all of these movements are strongly territorial. And what they seem to do, and the, the take-home message for me of an oil state like Nigeria, is oil and its centralization has kept Nigeria together through trying to distribute money to buy political consent. At the same time, these manner of conflicts that have generated are strongly territorial, which often, in fact, are about <laughs> the affirmation of local identities, ethnic identities, religious, village identities, that stand in contradiction to a national sense of identity. So it is it where you have a type of contradictory or a dialectical relationship between oil rents being captured by the state who attempts to keep this complex thing together, and then on the other hand, locally as it plays themselves out, processes of fragmentation and political dispersion that seems to stand in tension to. But that's where I would leave my comments, just to simply say in that sense, you know, these petrostates have, again, have to be examined through the specificities of global oil, which doesn't correspond to a simple sense of neoliberalism, and how global oil is both shaped and partly produced locally. Great. That was actually a wonderful layered understanding from the top to the bottom.
So we are now going to plow you with a few questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. Love to. So who would like... Billy, you should come and join us. Yes, I am. Uh, who would like to begin? Yes. Sandra. Um, Sandra. Hi. I wanted to ask a question about the role of civil society yeah. in... Um, actually, more like the role of uh, organizations like the United Nations or the Human Rights Watch. I know that you talk about it in your article, but could you expand on that? Like, what do they actually do so that... <coughs> okay, that is also a multi-layered question. If you start from this presumption of this oil complex, you obviously start from the presumption that this has some big, powerful players and forces constituting it, from U.S. militaries to private militaries to state-owned oil companies to Exxon. They're so, one of the ways in which, for example, the U.N. or multilateral institutions have begun to respond to the this oil complex is to say it's characterized by a lot of lack of transparency and accountability. Let's try to open that up. Let's try to make the big oil companies, I have to say nothing of the state-owned oil companies, a little bit more transparent. It was actually Mr. Blair who, because of a crisis surrounding BP, where it came to light that BP had paid an one Angolan individual $200 million to acquire a license in Angola, that in fact he established what was called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Now, it's voluntary. No one compels Exxon or, the, or Saudi Aramco to be members. But if you do, you then have to open up your books to a, essentially a third party, essentially a, an accounting firm. Mm -hmm. We can argue about how significant and how important that is. But these are the sorts of multilateral processes. The IMF, God forbid, actually, has something called an oil diagnostics system, which says, we ain't going to lend to you unless, in fact, you open up some of your books surrounding who gets oil revenues, what's the revenue allocation, etc., etc. So, th so that's one. Now, obviously, at another level, there's a series of, you mentioned civil society groups, that are, of course, operating in and around the question of how, wh what is the consequence of the oil industry on the ground. That could be environmental, has a huge <coughs> ecological footprint. Right? And A. And some civil society groups are concerned with that because oil spills happen for whatever reasons. Local oil, local oil communities, which depend for their existence on the land, are not compensated. So this is part, civil society, often legal, contesting compensation. But there's also a bunch of civil issues, of course, around human rights violations, in which, as you know, oil companies have been directly complicit. Why? Because if oil is a national security resource, as it is everywhere, then often the oil fields are militarily policed. Uh, anything like resistance and opposition produces a ferocious military response. That's as true in Venezuela as it is in Angola, etc., etc. Well, so in the case of Nigeria, we've had this long history of grave human rights violations. Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and Nigerian civil society groups have been important actors in trying to document that. And then last but not least, what you've seen, and some of you maybe saw the New York Times today, where Chevron uh, was hit with a $9 billion claim because of its operations in, uh, in Ecuador, right? It's going to have a hell of a trip. They're going to have some real trouble getting that $9 billion, let me tell you. But be that as a myth. <laughs> but what's that all about? That is all about, obviously, civil society, but here, organizations using the law to hold foreign companies accountable for their operations, whether that is involved in complicit human rights violations, ecological and environmental disturbances and costs, etc., etc., and what we've seen is there a whole raft of not just local um, legal uh, action, but the, the significance of the Ecuador case, among others, is that not only are now cases being brought through local judiciaries in Ecuador, Colombia, Nigeria, but now these cases are increasingly being held or being heard in the countries in which the companies do business, which, of course, the companies do not want at all. And most of that is happening through a very quirky law, the Alien Tort Claims Act, two centuries old. It was developed by Washington for completely different purposes. But now, if you're lucky, allows claims brought by villagers in Nigeria uh, who, let's say, were shot by Nigerian uh, and private uh, security forces to be heard in the U.S. Mm. So that's a complicated answer, but I, I don't want to say that... it. Civil society or the UN 
all of those organizations operate, as you might expect, at different points in this oil complex through different sorts of mechanisms. Good. Yes. Laura. Yes, Laura. Hi. Thank you for being here. This yeah. is really exciting. Anyway, um, I was wondering, in your article you do, in my opinion, make a really good case of like historical analysis mm. in regards to what's going on in the petrol states, particularly in Nigeria. However, I am curious as of to what are some of the prescriptions mm. that you might give or that you might think might actually help the situation, um, either at a local, you know, regional, state, or international level. Well, again, that would have to operate at a variety of levels, right? I mean, one, it seems to me, is that law, and not only international law, but national systems of law, have increasingly become vehicles through which communities that are deleteriously impacted by oil, local, can now ha seek some type of redress. That's happening. It's still complicated because there isn't a body of law. It's not like you could take your case to the world court yet. What? Two, and this is uh, maybe not what you're quite going toward, but you know, some people think that the rise of a corporate social responsibility movement goes some way toward addressing your question. Right? You go into any company, Microsoft, BP, they have corporate social responsibility standards, and they say, well, we do this, we do that, we spend money, we adhere to the law, etc. Now, we can have a. I, I, I'm, I'm quite cynical about these sorts of things, but I would also say you know, that there have been some notable and important areas in which something has been achieved. Not perhaps in the oil and gas sector yet, but if you think particularly on the labor standards issue with respect to Nike or the sub-assembly electronics industry, where a whole bunch of cases in South and Southeast Asia, for example, have come to light, where civil society organizations have now been able to put pressure on companies to agree <coughs> to CSR, co corporate social responsibility standards, to be to be held accountable to third-party assessment of labor conditions, let's say. So, we would probably have very mixed opinions about what work you think something called corporate social responsibility can do, but that's, that's another. If we just jump down into those oil-producing states themselves, one of the areas, uh, there, there, there are a couple of areas that strike me where you see interesting types of redress, but I want to try to complexify it. In a sense, Not too long because we're running out of time it. soon. Thirty seconds. Obviously, one of the one of the sources of re of redress is the emergence of popular opposition, women's groups, and an insurgency. We don't, <coughs> I'm not ar arguing for armed insurgency. I'm saying that's in the in the long history of oil. That what has that ultimately done? Well, it has, in some sense, brought government to the table. But the question <coughs> becomes: there in those insurgencies or those popular movements, what is the basis of popular mobilization? Is it because my ethnic group is being screwed over, I'm Egil, and I make these claims on the state in the... Well, that's what Harvey, incidentally, calls militant particularism. It can often produce a xenophobic response as much as a type of civic national response. Right? So that's one set of responses. And the last set of responses, you have some very interesting um, NGOs now working on this transparency of the, the, the revenue process. Especially now, it's, it's based in part on... Uh, some things that some students of Michael have been worked on called participatory budgeting in Brazil and in India, where now popular pressure is put on local government budgets to say, show me what you've done with the dough. And communities now get to participate in those budgetary discussions and in the process of monitoring, as opposed to it being a black hole. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you something that you said now here in your talk about that how we should like understand this general process mm. and the oil industry in terms of neoliberalism or mm. not. And what I'm thinking about is, of course, if you're trying to get an overall framework uh, as neoliberalism, always when you go down to the specific cases, it becomes too complex and there is a lot of things which doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. But if you want to have an overall framework, um, then you have to like say there is something which maybe doesn't fit. And I wanted to ask you, because I'm mm. thinking of neoliberalism like the thing about the free market within neoliberalism is often very much has nothing to do with reality, but it often only a thing well that said. you're saying to well an, as an argument. Neoliberalism and free market is not well that said. connected in reality. Well said. But what is very important, and which we learned from Harvey, is the redistribution of wealth. Uh, 
and the upper class taking back the power and also through the state, that the state becomes a, a tool for the upper classes to, to make this redistribution of wealth. Yeah. And I'm thinking, isn't that exactly what happened, happening well in Nigeria? And I'm like, well said. I, I know that it's, if you're looking down, it's so mm. extremely mm. complex, mm. but I'm just thinking like the overall framework, isn't that what's happening? What a great, what a great comment. <clears throat> I mean, you're right. Of course, Harvey does make that point very importantly, that there's a world of difference between an ideology of free markets what Newt Gingrich says when he's singing the song of neoliberalism, and in fact what states or governments or what actual transactions look like. There, and there can be direct contradictions between. Harvey makes that very powerfully. You're right. And so therefore, perhaps I shouldn't be so concerned about the oil and gas sector looking, or as I put it, at an angle to neoliberalism. But I would still maintain my point that this to me looks like a bulwark a tightly regular, it looks like deeply politicized markets that couldn't possibly resemble even the most contradictorily um, unexpected form of neoliberal markets that David talks about. So I would still try to make a strong argument, notwithstanding what you've, what you've just said, about, um, uh, about the, the unusual nature, and perhaps why, incidentally, um, so much of what passes as foreign policy, especially U.S. foreign policy, is in the business of putting pressure on this oil complex that is so tightly regulated to open up. I mean, the U.S., arguably, Iraq, 2003, one of its goals, among other things, was that precisely to actually privatize the Iraqi oil company. The U.S. has been leaning on Saudi Arabia forever to liberalize and privatize Saudi Aramco and the oil sector. So, that, so that's my first response. My se your second point is, you're right, we never want to be, in the name of doing ethnography, n not be able to see the wood for the trees. And so you're right, in these cases of conflicts that I talked about, of course they have a strong <coughs> social class character. Whether you would look at oil states as e exemplars of a restoration of class power, when it seems to me their whole history has been about the dominance of classes within the state throughout its history. They change, who was that there? So I'm not sure it's a restoration of class power, but it's certainly about class dominance that emerges from the state control, from a rentier economy. But you're also right in saying that, of course, underlying all of this, these case studies of conflict are, right out of Harvey, processes of accumulation by dispossession. A statutory monopoly over land that Venezuela or Angola or Nigeria. What is that? That's a classic case of accumulation by dispossession. So and what, what do we you mean by accumulation by dispossession? Well, in this sense, Harvey, right, is talking, as I understand it, Harvey's talking about a process by which accumulation emerges out of some type of privatization of something that could be called a commons. Right? We've got to be careful how we use that term, because it seems to me he would include within that sense of commons the privatization of public housing in Mrs. Thatcher's period. Also, I would include within it the commons of land. Uh, of course, land rights in Africa are very complicated, but in fact, it's certainly dispossession in the sense it's taken a statutory state monopoly over all of these local land rights and said, no, they're ours, subsurface. So, and what I'm saying in a sense then is that the various types of politics and conflicts that emerge on the oil field are about responses to that process of dispossession. But they take politically, in my view, very, they're a mixed bag. There's why, lots of movements. Why can't you talk about mend? Because we had a okay, lot of discussion okay, about go. mend. Here, classic case. Here we go. So here's mend. They blow onto the scene in 2006. So mend is what? Uh, is the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. Very good. So this is this powerful, highly militarized group. Now, what are they all about? Are they, in fact, as Collier says, organized crime? I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of these people. I, I don't tell my wife this too much. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> they're... Shot by them on yeah, a number of occasions. Agreed, but be that as it may. The, the point, I, I wouldn't endorse this as a pro project, but there, are they involved in oil theft to fund their insurgent? Absolutely. No question about it. But on the other hand, within that group is a deep tension between, on the one hand, their claims about what they call resource control and the need to change the basis by which those revenues are allocated. And their role is, no, the oil is ours, and actually we get all the money and then you, the government, should tax us.
so on the one hand, they have a t they have a t set of political claims about who owns the oil, who controls it, and what's the regulatory process. But on the other hand, it's absolutely clear that MEND is a deeply, in a multi-ethnic area, a deeply ethnic insurgency. The dominant group in that region are Ejil, they're Ejil. And they're constantly, it seems to me, tottering, Michael, on this knife edge between what I could call civic nationalism, we need to rethink the constitution, the legal basis for revenue allocation, the land rights on the one hand, things that you and I would recognize, and on the other falling into, frankly, a rather ugly and na nasty ethnic nationalism, xenophobic, at the expense of building some pan-ethnic movement. There are 60, diff 60 six zero different types of ethnic groups in this oil-producing region. So, so men then is, it seems to me, is constantly playing this game where it's been hugely successful in its ability to leverage world attention and the, <coughs> and the attention of the state to its grievances. And it seems to me they're, uh, this is not an endorsement for violence, it's just <coughs> simply about the, the, the truthfulness of those grievances. And on the other hand, it seems to me, having elements within it that are talking the language of ethnopolitics at the expense of other local ethnic groups. So that's a, that's a, I could, I could say more about men, but that, that it seems to me is, and it speaks to the issue of the local. You could see that in terms of here's a group who see themselves as excluded politically. They, it, they, they're often dominated by young, unemployed men uh, in a gerontocratic society that can be seen in social class terms. They have right and proper claims about the ecological footprint of the industry, how it's devastated their livelihood. All of those things. Are right. But it's built it around a process of ethnic mobilization. Right. And ethnic ethnicity is a very labile category. Who is ethnic and who is not, and who gets to define the boundaries of it, is not just God-given. Right. Some of you have maybe heard of perhaps one of the most famous groups that emerged in Nigeria, the Agoni movement. Ken Sarawiba in the 1990s. There is no Agoni ethnic group. There isn't. There's no God. What he did was to stitch together five different types of sort of related ethnic groups. Brilliantly. So all I'm trying to say is that often these ethnic movements are by definition tottering on the edge of falling apart. Or who gets included, who gets excluded. It's a discursive and a political project. And MEND is... Wavering. Yeah. Any last question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my question was going to be about men and inequality yeah, versus ethnicity, but I can maybe ask you to elaborate on how representative men would be for civil society as some sort of counter yeah. movement. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. You know, it was. It's often said, or was said, in the wake of uh, September 11th that whilst very few, very, very few individuals within the Muslim world would ever endorse the type of tactics of Al-Qaeda, there was nonetheless a recognition that as its political project, if you took it on paper, that there was a certain amount of sympathy for what indeed Zawahiri or Mr. Bin Laden had to say about corruption in Egypt or the utterly rotten and corrupt class structure of Middle East. In the same way, if you were, if we were to fly tomorrow to the Niger Delta and I was to take you into those rural communities, you would get a lot of um, sympathy expressed about what these young boys are doing in terms of their political project. Absolutely, we support Right? The claim that we need to, it's our oil, that we need to think about a change in the revenue allocation process. That will be constitutional and legal, etc., etc. But I would have to say that there is, and perhaps a, this has increased over the last five years or so, a growing profound disenchantment with the extent to which uh, violence associated with the insurgency has grown, has seemingly become undisciplined and uncontrolled, because MEND is now fracturing in all sorts of complicated ways, not unrelated to this ethnic issue.
And I think there's a profound sense that whilst there is this, what I'm calling a sympathy, um, I, I think as an insurgency that that popular support is waning very, very quickly. And I think that's, as I say, related to a bunch of issues, but not the least of which, in a sense, is the fact that MEND has been hugely successful. It said it was going to close down the oil industry. In three months, it cut production by half. Mm. It, it's enormously well organized militarily. And you now have, after 50 years of neglect, a, young ge a generation of young men that are, you know, that, that the, the well of their anger and resentment, this is what always strikes me, is so deep. It is so deep. And when it is that deep, then you unleash those powers, and particularly in a movement that may be, in any case, is difficult to keep together, it's very easy for that movement to, <coughs> to fragment, to disperse, and for forms of violence to emerge that are sort of nasty. And, I, and again, I think this wearing down of popular sympathy is not related to the fact that there's a sense in which now that those oil fields are borderline ungovernable right now. They sort of are. You know, I mean... I don't know how the oil companies operate anymore now. They have, you know, every, any oil workers are driven around in military convoys. I mean, it's just, that's what it, that's what it feels like. It feels like um, a military operation. And I'm just simply saying that all of that contributes to this popular sense of, wait a second, these political claims were in some sense legitimate, but we didn't sign up for this. Very good. So, so. Although you are a geographer, that was a brilliant explication of global sociology. We're starting from the global economy, <laughs> state, civil society. That was fantastic. I, I thought what was really interesting is, this, is the money issue. That actually, this is a, Nigeria is probably a totter, and not only, it's not only this area is tottering, <coughs> but Nigeria is in a precisely, sense tottering. Precisely. And, and what holds it together is this money, 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 money. And money is a very fragile means of holding societies together and so that's absolutely really, right so it's a very very fragile situation precisely because of all the money and exactly so that's the curse moment it is the cur and the, and and it, of course popularly when you look at government which all that it means is just doling out dough mm. by fair means or foul i mean you can see why the language of moral decay and corruption mm. that is so endemic not only in nigeria but for example much of the middle east you can see where it, why it has purchase. I mean, my God, it's just, as you say, it's money just being frittered away. It's, so without any sort of institutions that With no institution buys. building. That's right. 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 Which is an old sociological Correct. message. And related, yeah. there is a, finally, related, there's the question of, under those circumstances, what type of national identification do individuals have as regards Nigeria? What does it mean anymore when the institution that prima facie is about the process of nation building, of establishing a sense of national identification, isn't doing that? It's handing out dough. And conversely, you're fo again, if we fly to Nigeria tomorrow to the Niger Delta, and we go into that village and you ask he or she, what's your primary form of identification? They're not going to say Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, I'm Ijo. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm Adoni. I'm Ogoni. You push a little more, well, uh, yeah, I'm a member of the evangelical church. And somewhere down the way, you might get Nigeria. Mm. So in a sense, then, that type of institutional fragility that comes from the logic of money also has these spillover effects, not only of a, of a perception of moral decay of the state, but whether the state can consolidate a sense of national unity and national identification. And I don't think so. I think it's unraveling. Well, on that very pessimistic note, we must thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.